hello, Grove family. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Whether you're joining us online or here in person, I am so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. My name is Nicole Robinson, and I serve here at the Grove. Before we get started with today, I want to have a few, I'm going to share with you a few announcements. Uh, if it's your first time with us, we want to get to know you. Would you please fill out our Connect card? It can be found online or in your bulletin. And you can bring that Connect card over to Guest Central. We would love to get to know you and share more with you about the Grove. We are very excited about our all-church worship night this Wednesday, November 3rd at 6.30 p.m. This includes all ministries, kids, youth, Spanish speakers, the deaf and hard of hearing, grandmas, grandpas, everyone is invited to come together and pray for our new love offering and our theme of 2022. We also have some information in your bulletin today about outreach opportunities and informational meetings regarding outreach. And then each family should have received a Trek booklet coming in today. And we encourage you to use that as a prayer guide throughout this year to pray for our global partners. Please make sure that you check out the bulletin for all of the events that are happening here at the Grove. And now will you please stand and join us in worship. Oh, how are we doing tonight, Grow family? Doing well? So, you know, we come into this room, we say, oh, let's stand, let's worship, right? Yeah. Sometimes is everybody's hearts just like ready for it, or is it like it kind of takes a moment, right? Sometimes it takes a moment. Is that just me, or is that some other people in the room too? <laughs> All right. Let me hear the honest people. That's good. You know, sometimes we come in, and it's like that. There's a, we're going to sing an old hymn. That hymn says, tune my heart to sing thy grace. You know, sometimes we come into this room and, and, you know, just like my guitar, you know, I, I need to spend time making sure it's tuned. Just like the car that brought you here tonight, if you don't keep that maintained and keep it tuned up, right, it's not going to last for very long. It's not going to go very far. You know, just like that, we come together in this room and we ask God to tune our hearts so that we are in line with him. Amen? Let's pray tonight. God, we love you so much. And we come before you just wanted to worship you with our entire heart. God, tune it tonight. Cause us to be more in line with you tonight than we were before we walked in this room, Lord. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Peace. 
my heart. Take and seal it, seal it for.
Father, we praise you. We praise you that we can come before you tonight. We praise you that we can, we can open up your word, that God, we would ask that it would just fall fresh in our hearts tonight. God, that you would change us, that we would leave here changed. Continue to tune our hearts throughout the rest of this evening. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Why don't you take just a moment, greet someone around you tonight here at the Grove. family, how you doing this afternoon? Doing good? You, en you enjoy those worship songs from the 90s? <laughs> Nails in our hands, man. Not our hands, in his hands, but that's, been, that's a good song, real good. Well, hey, glad that, that you could join us this afternoon here at the church. I'm going to start off in a second by uh, interviewing Casey Jackson. Casey Jackson is the interim CEO at Path of Life Ministry. She's coming up right now. Give a nice warm welcome to, to Casey Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> Um, she used to work at the Grove, and now she's a CEO. That's what happens when you work at the Grove. You later on become a CEO. Uh, with that, we actually have some job opportunities at the Grove. Um, so you can check. I'm, I'm not joking. You can check it out online. Uh, we're looking for a head accountant. Mal Martha Roundtree, who's been here for so many years, is retiring. She's been such a blessing. So looking for the right person. I'm even hoping it's someone that's in our church family that we can hire. Um, someone on the cleaning team. We need a lot of cleaning team people, facilities, all different types of jobs. And remember could be a CEO one day when you work at the Grove, all right? So Casey, you're big time. Yes. How, how you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. Yeah? Yeah. Well, awesome. We're glad to have you here. Not only is she the interim CEO at Path of Life Ministries, she's also, you also go to the Grove, you and your family. I do. yes. How long have you been going to the Grove? About eight years now. All right. Of course, my husband was here a long time ago, but uh, All right, yeah. well, well, cool, right <laughs> on. Well, uh, we reached out to you and asked how we can just be a blessing to Path of Life Ministries in um, this year's love offering, we always like to partner with you. What, what, what did you tell us that we could do to help prepare the way for people to follow the Lord there? What are you hoping the Grove will participate in with you? Great. Yeah. Um, we are a growing organization. Um, we do a lot of work with our homeless individuals here in our community. And one thing came up last year was that we were no longer going to be able to drive our moving truck in the state of California. Now, the moving truck did a lot of things. It would deliver furniture to people moving into their new homes. It would deliver uh, supplies, food boxes, um, other things that we needed at the shelter. And so when it came time to sell it, we could not actually get back enough money to buy a new one. And so since then, we've been borrowing and hopefully volunteers here and there. Um, but this truck will allow us to go back to being fully independent on that in that way and um, allow us to continue to do our mission, which is to rescue, restore, rebuild, and redeem the lives of those in our community. Awesome. So she asked that the group could help with that. So part of our love offering is to be purchasing a truck for Path of Life Ministries to, to use. Right. For placemakers as well, which is the other uh, love offering option, which is we'll be moving people into homes with decorations and furniture and a full home instead of just what we can find at the time. So this will be exciting. Well, awesome. Well, we're thankful for all that Path of Life does. We're thankful for you. And I just want to pray for you right now because I know you have a big job. So <laughs> let's pray for her. Father, we come before you. We thank you for your goodness. We're thankful for Casey and that you just put this calling on her life to care for those um, in our city who, who, who need homes. Um, give her wisdom in her role. Uh, give her strength. Give her energy and help us to come alongside her and be a blessing to those in need. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for coming. Uh, today, we continue in our second week of really sharing our vision with our church family um, of what we believe God has laid in our heart to do in 2022. So if you're new to the Grove, you're like, wow, you're coming at a great time to hear uh, what the Lord has put on our heart. E every year, we um, kind of vision cast during this time. We call it our love offering. Um, we have brochures where we do a million dollars worth of projects uh, locally, globally, 
um, and in our church, our church community as well, and then people in our church, um, they give generously to this. Our goal last year was to raise a million dollars, and we raised 1.5 million dollars, um, which was which was awesome. We can keep, yeah, amen. Um, for for that, we ask people to give above and beyond their ties and offerings. You'll notice this isn't a big, just big, big ask because this is a part of our culture. Our people love to be a part of this. We'll ask people to pledge and give two two weekends from now. Right now, you're just going to be hearing about different things that the church is doing um, along along the way. With, with that, we tied into an annual theme that aligns all of our ministries with what we're going to be teaching through, and uh, I announced that last weekend that our annual theme for 2022 is going to be Follow Me, Uh, not necessarily Follow Me Daniel, uh, but this is the call of Jesus in our lives, that Jesus comes and he calls out to people not just to solely believe in me, but to follow me with where he's leading us, with where he wants us to go. Last weekend we talked about John the Baptist because we're starting to go through the book of Mark. Um, And John the Baptist prepared the way for people to follow after Jesus. Um, And once they started following Jesus, you would see the calling on our lives as Christians is to prepare the way for other people to follow as well. And this is a a year on discipleship, how, how God has called us, the Grove, not only to be a disciple of Jesus, but also to make disciples of Jesus. Our, our main passage today is going to be Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 14 through 20. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them up there. Uh, typically at the Grove, we, we read through the NIV. Today, I'm going to be reading through the ESV. It's my, my personal favorite translation of the Bible. Um, so we'll be, we'll be doing that. And we're going to see in this passage immediately that John the Baptist's ministry is suddenly going to come to an end, and Jesus's ministry is going to begin. So let's look at at Mark 1. We'll read the first two verses, 14 through 15. It says, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus's ministry begins right when John the Baptist is arrested. Now, the Greek word for arrested means to be handed over. That John the Baptist was not just arrested, but he was handed over to be in jail. Now, this is interesting because John the Baptist, he prepared the way for Jesus and his ministry to begin. But not only did he prepare the way for Jesus' ministry, But what we see here is that he also prepared the way for Jesus' death. Um, I mean, John is just kind of this walking image, a forerunner of Jesus, and saying this is what his life is going to look like. This is the message that he is going to bring. And now we're also seeing that his death is also the exact same thing, that John the Baptist was handed over for nothing wrong that he did, and he's going to die. His head is going to be chopped off. And yet Jesus is going to be handed over himself for nothing wrong that he did. I mean, it's a forecast of what is to come. Like I said, John didn't do anything wrong. Long story short, King Herod and his wife did not like John the Baptist and put him in prison. Like I said, eventually he is decapitated. His death was unwarranted. Um, His death was wrong. But scripture says he was handed over. Who was he handed over by? He was handed over by God. This was God's divine plan for his life. Now, isn't it interesting, just even thinking about this a little, little bit more, that while John is in prison, approaching death, Jesus is not fighting to get him out. Now, is he? Jesus is not going over to the prison like, hey, let him out. He didn't do anything wrong. This government is so corrupt. Get him out of here. I'm not stopping until you get him out and this government changes. Instead, what's Jesus doing? He's just like preaching good news. The good news of the kingdom of God, it is here. Why? Because Jesus had a mission to complete. A very interesting passage, I think timely passage in in this day, 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4. Paul, instructing his spiritual son, Timothy, says, Join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Young Timothy, join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in little civilian affairs. 
Don't just get tangled in this little stuff going on here, civilian affairs, but rather he tries to please his commanding officer. Good soldiers focused on pleasing the commanding officer, Jesus Christ. I mean, what a, what a good word from Paul to his spiritual son, Timothy. And girl family, I would just encourage us once again in these times, stay focused on pleasing your commanding officer as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Keep in mind, this, this world, everything is planned out. Our, our Lord is sovereign over everything. I'm not saying don't get involved in civilian affairs or government affairs. I'm not saying that. I, I think that we should have a voice as Christians. I do. I'm also saying this. There are going to be things that are done in this world that are unjust. And that they are unjust and that they are planned out in God's sovereignty. And in this time, Christians need to make sure that they're staying focused on pleasing the commanding officer and realize that God is paving the way for the gospel to be spread, for the good news to be spread. And what Satan would want more than anything else is for us to get tangled up in some type of civilian affair, governmental affair, where we stop spreading the good news. So even just these couple verses right here, just think about Jesus, his cousin, in prison for wrong things, Yet Jesus is going for it, and he starts preaching the good news that God the Father sent him to do. That this is what he wanted him to do. God handed over John to be killed. That was his lot. Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And remember, the gospel means good news. Now, when we say gospel, a lot of times we think Jesus coming and dying on the cross for our sins. Is this the gospel that Jesus came and preached right then? Did he come out saying, Jesus, myself, is going to die on the cross for your sins. I'm going to rise again. Um, you need to accept me into, into your heart and, and, and believe in me. Well, that's not the very first message of the gospel that he began to share. That, that is the gospel that we preach, but that's not the one that Jesus started to preach right here. Jesus wasn't preaching about himself dying on the cross yet, but he was saying good news. And the good news that Jesus came preaching and proclaiming is that the time has come. The time has come for the kingdom of God to be established. I am the founder of this kingdom. Repent, be baptized, and turn to your king. Because I'm right here. Point number one on your notes, if you're taking notes, I hope you are. Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom of God. He preached the gospel. And Jesus comes and he's declaring, let it begin. Let the kingdom begin. Now, God's kingdom and rule, we know this, it was already established in heaven. There's countless psalms that you can look at where you see God who's in heaven, and it's talking about how the Lord, he reigns. I mean, the Lord reigns. But now something's different. Now his, his kingdom and his rule would break into this world like never before, and we would see his glory in a very personal way way he would defeat his enemies he would offer forgiveness for those who would repent of their sins and we would follow after the king this was good news this was the gospel that was preached i love the idea of the kingdom of god you see it all throughout the gospels i think it would be a great annual theme for us to go through maybe even a couple of years from now because the kingdom of god we see it's, it's in heaven the kingdom of god is there he rules and jesus comes and says the the time has been fulfilled. It's now. The kingdom of God is, is here. It is, it is present. And now we're also looking forward to the kingdom of God where we'll be in heaven one day for eternity because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for our sins where we could actually have a relationship with the king so we await the kingdom of God. It's here. You can be a part of the kingdom of God and yet it's not yet. We're not there yet. But it's being established and that's what the good news that Jesus came He's saying, what time is it? He's saying, it's not game time, it's kingdom time. It's coming. Repent and be baptized. Now, repent, it's not just saying, okay, say you're sorry. Repent, when you look at the original meaning of the word, it, it means to change your mind. It means to think differently. It means to change your mind from following sin. And now you're choosing to follow the King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, once Jesus started his ministry, once he kind of gives this talk, the kingdom of God is at hand, the time is fulfilled, what does he do? Well, he begins to build his kingdom. 
That's what he does. So he goes out, you're going to have a kingdom, you're going to need followers. So he goes and he starts to get his followers. And he goes, and the first people he calls are two, two brothers. Let's look at verse 16 and 18, these two brothers. Mark 1, 16 through 18. It says, passing alongside the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now, now notice that Jesus doesn't start recruiting people for his kingdom in Jerusalem. He doesn't start going to like big businesses, important people. But he starts in Galilee, the humble uh, city of Galilee, one of the lowest places on the earth. And I'm, I'm serious. The Sea of Galilee is the lowest a freshwater lake on the face of this planet. And it appears that Jesus is just walking by the sea. He's just walking by the Sea of Galilee. He sees Simon, he sees Andrew, two brothers fishing, and he said to them, hey, follow me, and I'll make you become fishers of men. Now, now what do you think? What would you say if you were in their position? I think I would say, no, thank you. <laughs> Sounds kind of weird. <laughs> I don't even know who you are. (laughs) Why in the world would I follow you? You're just calling out to me while I'm fishing. Now keep in mind, this is Mark's account of the story. What do we say about Mark and how he, he writes? He's to the point. He's very direct. Let's just get to the facts. Jesus wants to build his kingdom. What did he do? He went and called those fishermen and they immediately did it. Next story, right? You know, that's it. But there's more to it than that. In fact, that's not the first interaction that Simon and Andrew even had with Jesus. First interaction that you can actually see they had is in John 1, 35 through 42, where Andrew is hanging out with John the Baptist. And while Andrew's hanging out with John the Baptist, they see Jesus walking and John says, look, there's the Lamb of God. And what does Andrew do? Andrew runs and tells his brother Simon, Simon, we found the Messiah. He's here. So what do they do? They run over to Jesus. And then Jesus has this interaction with him. He's like, okay, your name's no longer Simon, but it's going to be Peter. And I'm sure in that moment he's like, oh, okay, <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> and, and you. They have this interaction that's going on. So you have Mark 1. This is what I love about the Gospels and the writers and how you're getting different pictures of what's taking place. Luke, he gives us a, a longer account of this story that I read in, in Mark chapter 1. If you look at Luke chapter 5, you actually see the longer uh, the longer length story of this, more clarity on why Simon and Andrew even followed Jesus. They weren't dummies following a strange man they'd never met before. They had good reason to follow after him. I won't read the whole story, but just to paraphrase a little bit about Luke's account, this is the story where the fishermen were out all night. They're out all night, they're fishing, they don't catch anything, they're coming back in and they're tired, and who shows up but Jesus. And Jesus comes, and he already is gaining influence. He has some followers, and he tells Simon Peter, Simon, take your boat and put it right out on the shore. And Jesus begins to teach from it. And after he teaches for a time, he tells Simon Peter, Simon, I want you to cast the boat out into the deep, and I want you to take your nets and drop them again. And, and, and Simon's like, I already did this. There's no fish, okay? And Jesus must have given him a look. He does it, and they catch so much fish that their nets begin to break. I mean, they're just piling these fish in. And it tells us the two boats that are out there, they begin to sink in the water. And what does Simon do? He falls onto the ground and he says, depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. I think this is interesting because this is the message that Jesus comes in building his kingdom, repent and be baptized. And when you come face to face with the Messiah. You come face to face with the Son of God and you acknowledge who he is. A common response, which is going to happen, is you're going to fall on your knees and you're going to repent. And we see this with Simon. Simon repents of his sins and then he follows after Jesus. In Luke's account, he words it this way in Luke 5, 10 through 11. He says, and Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. So that's Luke's account. Let's go back to Mark and read his short version, because Mark just wants to get to the point. 16 through 17. Passing along the side of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. That's his story. So Jesus is building a team. This is what he's doing. He's 
He's recruiting his team. Um, He's about to bring about the kingdom of God on this earth. That's why he came. So he's He's looking for followers. He's looking for agents of his kingdom. He's looking for kingdom builders, those who are going to help him bring about the kingdom on this earth. And Jesus is saying, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men, which sounds kind of cute and creative, right? Like, oh, okay, Jesus, I see what you did there. Like they're fishermen, they fish for fish, I'll turn you into fishers of men. If they were construction workers, he would have said, follow me and I'll I'll." make you build men and women to strong buildings, maybe. Maybe that's what he would have said. Or if they were dentists, he would have said, follow me and I will help you extract the dead roots of sin and put crowns of glory on their molars as we bite off Satan's head. You know, maybe that's what he would say. But realize this. Jesus wasn't just being cute and creative. It wasn't just a nice little analogy for the fishermen. However, the idea of God calling persons to fish for people It was first found in the Old Testament. There's actually multiple passages on this. And all these passages don't have to do with rescuing people. It actually has to do with with judgment. One of the clearest versions of this that we see in Scripture is Jeremiah 16, 16. In this passage it says, But now I will send many fishermen, declares the Lord, and they will catch them. After that I will send many hunters, and they will hunt them down on every mountain and hill from the crevices of the rocks. You know, in this passage and other passages like another one in Ezekiel, it was to bring people into judgment. I'm going to catch them and bring them into judgment. Why? Because people have sinned. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And judgment day is coming. And we see that that's real. We see that it's just. And yet we also see in the, in the New Testament that God just doesn't want us to be punished for our sins but he wants to rescue us from our sins. So I think it's very fascinating to see these passages in the Old Testament, three, four of them that have to do about fishing in regards to bringing them into judgment. And Jesus comes and says, no, we're going to fish them to escape judgment, to be a part of my kingdom. And you, you are going to be a part of this. And we see how Jesus is modeling this for his disciples. I mean, Jesus is showing us how the fishing is done, even in calling Simon and Andrew. He preaches the gospel, repent and be baptized. Kingdom of God is here. He causes repentance. He gives them this compelling vision of them being a part of building the kingdom of God that you can help fish for people and save them from judgment. That You can be a part of this kingdom building where people are saved and they give God glory. You can picture Jesus going around saying, I want you to be a part of this team. I want you to be saved from judgment yourself, and I want you to be a part of this team. You can be a part of my kingdom for eternity. When we really start thinking about this passage, it's very compelling. Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. That he will make us become this. It's not even something that we have to do. He'll make us become this. The Greek word here for make, it also means construct. He will construct you into this disciple maker. It also means form or fashion that God will change you into a kingdom builder. That we are a work in progress. That doesn't just happen day one where you accept Jesus Christ into your life and like, boom, you're ready to go. I mean, look at the disciples themselves. How many mistakes do we see the disciples make throughout the Gospels? Over and over again, like, what are they doing? And yet Jesus gently corrects them teaches them along the way and then after three years around three years of caring for them molding them fashioning them constructing them making them become this he sends them out we see that in the great commission i read the great commission last week in matthew here we see it also in matthew 16 15 through 16 kind of the the end result it says and he said to them go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Did I give you point number two? Not yet. Point number two on your notes. I was supposed to give it to you a while ago. (laughs) I'm giving it to you now. Jesus begins to build his kingdom with a team and a compelling vision. So right when he says, like I said, his kingdom's going to come, he's going to establish it, He starts to build his team and give them a vision to be a part of what he's going to do next, which is exciting. You know, 
God spent a lot of time developing and growing his disciples, making them faithful, um, becoming fishers of men, just like he promised, and we can see the end result. Uh, in my small group this last week, we went and we talked about last week's sermon and kind of gave the vision of what God wants to do in our life, that he wants us to follow after him, and then he wants us to be a part of, of, of uh, bringing people into his kingdom, fishing for men. And one of the guys in, in our group, his name is Zach Ascara, he came up to me afterwards, and he's like, Daniel, I'm so excited for this theme. He said, this verse, Mark 117, has been something that, that really impacted my life. He said, when I played baseball at Cal Baptist, one of the players on the team, he really poured into me. He said, I feel like I gave my life to the Lord at that point in my life. And then this guy on the baseball team got cut. Um, he said, Daniel, I cried when he got cut. Um, just because I loved him so much, he helped me grow in my relationship. He did our team Bible studies um, as well. And he said, he, he called the guy and said, man, who's, who's going to lead the devotions you know, who's, who's going to be that example? He said the day after he got caught, he, show, he showed up to his, his door, and there was a fishing pole right next to his door. And there was a little card on it, and it said, it's time for you to fish for men. It's, it's your turn. And he actually sent me even a message of this. Um, he still has the card that this friend gave to him. He said, so I want to even get better at doing this. He said, I can see now why this guy poured into my life, shared the gospel with me, and told me now, now it's your turn to make disciples and to be this example. I mean, this is the calling of God in our life. Another girl, I've told you about her before. Her name is Carly. She goes to our church. She was on our uh, Little League team. She was actually my team mom. No one wants to be team mom, right? And I said, who wants to be team mom? We need one. She said, I'll do it. We got to know her. She'd never heard the gospel before. This was about three, four years ago. Natalie shared the gospel with her. Um, others shared the gospel with her. She started coming to women's Bible study. She accepted Christ into her life. She now goes to our church. She's in a women's Bible study. She heard the sermon last week, and she's like, I need to start sharing the gospel. She's been volunteering in rebirth homes. Guess what? This last week, she shared the gospel with a participant in rebirth homes, and the lady accepted Christ. Is that not amazing? And she sent this long text message to our small group, just saying, hey, Daniel, thanks for the sermon. Here's all the things that God's been teaching me. Natalie, thanks for discipling me these last three years. And now she had the honor and the privilege, get this, about three years later, people pouring into her, and now she brought someone to the Lord. This is what God's going to do in our life. He wants your life to be changed. He wants you to hear the good news of Jesus Christ and how he came to rescue you from your sins. He wants to save you. And then he wants to take that saving work in your life and use it to share with other people and prepare the way for other people to follow him. This is the calling of God on all of our lives. When Jesus called his first followers to establish his kingdom, he gave them this compelling vision of what they're going to do. And here's the thing, he knew they weren't there yet. He simply just wanted them to come as they are. Just come as you are and be changed by me. God is pursuing after you. He's pursuing after me. This is something that you see all throughout Scripture. This is something that's so unique. You'll see this on your notes on the second page. I've given you the five commentaries that I've read. I want you to know the sources of what I'm learning so that you can also go back. Maybe as we go through Mark, you even want to buy one of those commentaries as well. I think almost every single commentary noticed this. In, in Jewish custom during this time, if you wanted to study under a rabbi, you went to that rabbi and you said, I want to study under your teaching. But here you see Jesus going up to the people that he wants. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. He's not saying follow my teaching. He's not saying follow my law. He's saying follow me. And one thing I love about God's goodness is grace is that he initiates it. He makes the first move on us where we can see that there's an all-powerful, loving God who wants a relationship with me. And he wants a relationship with you. Maybe be why you're here today, because someone brought you, you just showed up. I can tell you, God wants a relationship with you. And then Mark shows us the, ide the ideal response that when God calls us to follow him, what we're supposed to do. Look at Mark 1, 18 through 20. Mark 1, 18 through 20, it says, and immediately. I told you that Mark uses this word over and over again, 42, 43 times throughout this book. He says, immediately. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat 
with the hired servants, and they followed him. Point number three on your notes. When Jesus calls us, when Jesus summons us, Jesus summons to respond immediately and completely. His calling on our life, when he calls us, we're supposed to respond immediately and completely. Let's start with immediately. That means without delay. It means that when he calls us, we're not going to be like, let me think about it for a second. It's like, no, he's calling me, I'm going to go. Mark says in verse 18 that Simon and Andrew immediately left their nets and they followed him without delay, without pause. Jesus finds where they are in the middle of their work day and he calls out, follow me, come as you are. And one thing that we have to see and one thing you have to know is that in your relationship with God, there's no prerequisite for following after God. He just wants you as you are. Even in your sin right now, he says, follow me, repent, turn, come to him right now. Jesus said, come to me, but come to me right now. That's a pretty radical call, isn't it? In that moment, come to me right now, just stop what you're doing and come to me. But it's a radical call today, too, because the calling is the same. God wants you where you're at right now. He wants us to respond to him. There's no such thing of saying, hey, Jesus, just give me a second. Can you just wait in the waiting room of my life? And when I feel like it's the appropriate time, I'll bring you out and then I'll have you come back in. No, there's no such thing as that. You are either telling Jesus, yes, I want to follow you right now, or you're telling Jesus, no, I don't want to follow you right now. And here's the thing. Some of you, you need to make the radical decision of immediately following Jesus right now. Jesus came to establish his kingdom and rule, not only in this, on this planet, but in your hearts, in your life. And you can be a part of his kingdom today. He came and lived a perfect life and died on the cross for our sins. He rose again, and he did this to show you his love. He wants to have a relationship with you. You just have to repent. You just have to change your mind and say, I don't want to follow the world. I don't want to follow after what I want. I want to to follow Jesus today. I want to follow him today. So then I even ask you today, is there anyone here today that would like to immediately follow Jesus right now and say, yes, I want to follow. If there's anyone that wants to do that today, I'd even like to invite you to stand in front of our church. In front of our church and say, I immediately want to follow him right now. I've heard the gospel before. I can tell that he's pursuing after me. I know that he wants a relationship in my life and I need to immediately do this. If there's anyone here that'd like to do that today, would you just stand? I've told people this before, that if you can't stand in front of people in the church that would clap and cheer for you and say, yes, I, I'm for you, then we'll never be able to stand on your own out front. I'll ask one more time. Is there anyone else that would like to stand and say, yeah, I want to give my life to the Lord today? Well, then we'll continue on. I've always said this, I have no problem if there's a time where someone doesn't stand. My job is just to prepare and present the gospel to you and may the Lord move how he wants to move. And know this, he's pursuing after you. Even if you're not ready, he's pursuing after you. Keep this in mind too, that the call to follow, it's not a half-hearted call to follow. These people left everything. They left their jobs, they left their nets, It was complete surrender to him. In verse 19 and 20, Jesus calls another group of brothers to follow him, James and John. They were in their boats mending their nets when it says that Jesus immediately called them and we're told they left their father Zebedee in the boat with their hired servants. That doesn't really sound nice, does it? It's like they're just there. Like, later, Dad, we'll see you later on. What does this mean? It means that they immediately followed after him. They completely followed him. They left their family business. They left these relationships. They left their dad sitting in the boat with the servants, their future owner. They left their financial security. They left all of these things. Why? 
Because God called them to follow. And when God calls us to follow and do something, even at a time where it doesn't make sense, well, we're supposed to respond and to follow after him, to be a part of building the kingdom of God. And we're hit with this reality that following means complete sacrifice before the Lord. This doesn't mean that you necessarily have to quit your job. Um, It doesn't mean that you necessarily have to leave your family. But for some people, that's a reality. Maybe you're in a job that God wouldn't approve of. Maybe your family wouldn't approve of your decision to follow after Jesus, and that's going to make situations a little bit difficult for you. Maybe God just has other plans for you in general. We see this especially with people who go overseas, that the call to follow, I mean, they're saying goodbye to their family, they're saying goodbye to their friends, they're saying goodbye to a a dream job that they want because God wants them to bring the gospel to other people. Um, I've actually observed many people do this, where they feel the calling of God on their life to go overseas. In fact, a person I've observed, I've observed do this really well um, is a man named Kellen Hirodo, who's going to be joining me up on stage in just a second. Um, I grew up with Kellen Hirodo at Pauley High School. Uh, he was a couple years older, uh, older than me, but he was a guy that I looked up to. I, I say this, Kellen was like the Tim Tebow of Pauley High School, all right, all, all the way around, good looking. I feel like every single girl had a crush on Kellen Hirodo. It's like, everyone likes Kellen. Why don't you like me? We like Kellen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, good looking dude. He carried his Bible at church. I mean, not at church, but um, at lunch. I mean, just like, just walking around like a stud. Uh, great soccer player. Ended up playing at, at USD. Um, he had calves the size of boulders. These things were massive. Um, interesting fact of the day, most common implants for males to get are calf implants. Did you know that? I think Kellen has gotten those, okay, (laughs) at a very young age. Like I say, he played soccer at USD. Now now he's a missionary in Africa, in Malawi. He's adopted uh, three kids with his wife, Becca, of course, because he's Kellen Hirodo and and like Tim Tebow. He works at a school and with orphanages, like I said, Tim Tebow. I I just thought, I want to interview this guy because I've looked at him from a distance. He wasn't my best friend in school just because he was older than me. But he was a guy that was just like, man, that guy follows after the Lord faithfully. And I've seen this consistently his whole life. So would you welcome Kellen Herodos? He comes up here and I interview him. All right, Kellen. It's great to have you here, man. I'm going to shake your hand. It's good seeing you. I was hoping hoping you're going to wear shorts. (laughs) Did you get implants? Just before freshman year. That, <laughs> that, that was secret until now. It all, it all makes sense. Well, let me start by asking you, were you as equally impressed with me in high school as I was with you? <laughs> I, just, I just think it's a fair question. <laughs> so you're calling me Tim Tebow. I'm going to say McCaffrey, Christian McCaffrey. <laughs> yeah. Blonde hair, it. athletic. I would like that. I'm thinking the NFL career much more successful on McCaffrey's side than <laughs> Tebow's side, but... You didn't look up to me. <laughs> That's okay, though. Well, well Kellen, why, why don't you start? Why, why don't you just tell, introduce us to your family, and, and what do you do in, in, in Malawi? Um, so I'm, I'm married to Becca, and actually met Becca in Malawi in our first year teaching. She's from Northern California. Uh, we have three awesome kids. Yami is 10, uh, Jaden is 8, and Kara is 4. And um, so we work with a mission called African Bible College. I'm a lecturer, professor in Christian education and biblical studies. And also gets to coach the soccer team um, at ABC. And we also have the privilege of working um, with Orphan Care, a ministry called Bright Vision, which you as the Grove have supported the last couple years in your love offering. Uh, We do work in education, in feeding, um, in agriculture, and in discipleship. I'm also very involved in our church in Malawi, International Bible Fellowship Church. I'm an elder there and uh, very much um, in tune with shepherding and discipleship. So uh, really our hearts are for discipleship in, in all of those contexts, and that just happens to be for us in Malawi. Cool, man. Why, why did you follow Jesus into Malawi to make disciples there? When did this first get into your mind? So actually I'd say that um, God was providentially working in my heart before I even knew. Um, as a kid, uh, you know, my parents who are here tonight, um, are Christians and uh, took us to church and they led trips down to Mexico that I remember going on, um, short-term house building trips in high school and uh, a short-term trip to Spain. And so I feel like the Lord was 
was planting those seeds, right? Opening the door of my heart to be willing to go. Um, actually, it's a little ironic, and I'm embarrassed to say it, but missionaries used to come to church and talk about their ministries. And I thought, these people are a little odd. <laughs> they wear weird clothes, and they talk about places that I'd never heard of, and um, they talk about lifestyles that I'm just, that's just not me. Um, now it's ironic, right? That I'm, <laughs> I'm up here and, and doing the same thing. Um, but so I, I feel like God was opening the door. And so when the opportunity came to go to Malawi, um, it, it wasn't a difficult decision. And with the affirmation of our family and friends and churches to go, um, there it was. Why, yeah. why did you leave everything and go? I think in the end, um, that, that has to come back to the gospel Right. I, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm not deserving of God's love in my life, um, and yet he would choose me. And so as a disciple of Christ, I'm called to love God w with everything I am and to love other people. And so I think of Galatians 2.20, actually was mentioned this morning in, in a song lyric. Right? I, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And so we sang, where you lead me, Lord, I'll follow. And at times that looks a little different than maybe what we think it would, right? In Mark chapter 8, Jesus is going to say, if, if you want to come after me, you must deny yourself and, and take up your cross and follow me. And so if we can sing those lyrics, it needs to be true of our lives as well, that we're willing to do whatever he would ask us to do. And there is a sense of sacrifice. You, you said leaving it all. Um, you talked about families. Uh, our families have sacrificed to have us gone. Um, funny story, my, my wife, when she was on her way to the airport with her parents, our first year teaching, her dad said, just don't meet some missionary who's going to take you to Africa for the rest of your life. <laughs> so when I had to meet her family, you know, I'm that guy. And... Uh, but no, it, it has been. It's been a sacrifice for our, our, our families. We're very grateful for them, you know, allowing us to go and affirming us to go. Um, but at the same time, we're grateful. Technology, travel makes it possible to stay connected. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's, not, it's not a begrudging obedience or submission to God. Right? When you catch a vision even of what we are singing today, right? how majestic Christ is, how worthy he is of our praise, Right? If we see people who are image bearers with needs in different places, right, there is nothing more worthy to give our lives to than to honor God and to serve other people. Um, and so for us, that, that was in Malawi. Cool. Why has this been one of the best decisions of your life? All right, so I can't, um, I can't promise this. But when I went to the mission field, I met my spouse. So uh, young folks, if you are eagerly looking, it could happen um, in missions. Now, I, I think for any person who would call themselves a Christian, um, following God, following Christ, and serving other people, God promises that that will be the most satisfying and joyful thing in your life. Uh, we've experienced that. Over the last 16 years, we have deep relationships there. We have purposeful work. We have colleagues and friends um, who are Malawian who, who teach us about faith and about following Christ. And so we, we have been, we've had lots of adventures. Um, we've had strange illnesses, mm -hmm. um, uncertainty, trials. And yet God has been incredibly faithful to us, right? And so... You know, I, I would say, you know, as I'm carrying around my Bible at lunchtime, evidently in high school, I don't remember doing that. Well, I remember. Um, <laughs> and playing soccer and, uh, you know, showing off my calves. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't have imagined writing my story, how it's been written, right? But God has, um, for Becca and me, um, written that story in Malawi for the last 16 years. Kellen, why, why is it important for the church to send out the best? Because you even said it. You thought our missionaries were a little weird. I've seen it before, too. It's like, what in the world is going on here? And yet I look, I look at the Bible, and they're sending out, they're sending out Paul. They're, they're sending out Barnabas. They're sending out Timothy. These are like the best. Why is that so important? You mentioned the Great Commission, right? The Great Commission is, is called that because it is global and also because it's so important. 
and the early church in Acts. They're living that out right away. Discipleship in a missions context should be a central priority for every local church. Right? It's not the only priority, but it should be a core priority that's reflected in everything you do. Your preaching, your teaching, uh, how you budget, how you pray, where you direct people, um, and also in who you send. Right? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would say is oftentimes we think of the best as those who are the most gifted or accomplished. And yet, in God's economy, the Bible tells us that the best are those who are faithful, right? those who are people of character, those who serve. Um, and so even as you think of, you know, we want to send our best people, so you want to send your most faithful, um, mature servants, right, into missions because God deserves that. And the people of the nations deserve that. They deserve that. And that's a change of mindset, even for myself, because sometimes like, I want the best here at the Grove. I've got to hire them. But maybe we need to tell our, the faithful, the ones that we just see God's hand on, hey, you, need, you need to go overseas. Because the amount of work that it takes to start a church, to learn the language, to do these things, man, we need our hardest workers out there. I, I see why, Kellen, God called you out to Malawi. I see that um, from afar. Um, we're, we're called to make disciples. What, what, what encouragement would you have for those who are thinking of going overseas to do mission work? Like, ah, I'm thinking about it. What would you tell them? Convince them. Give them your sales pitch. Show, show them your calf. Just do something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, no. <laughs> I already, already gave the pitch on, uh, on a spouse, right? Um, <laughs> no, we are, we are called as, as believers to, um, to give our whole lives to Christ and um, to be willing to go. I, I think um, anyone here who is a follower of Christ, everyone has to be open to the, uh, to the, the possibility of going. Now, that, that goes to the senior in college who is ready to go. That goes to the family who has four kids, right, in the middle of their career. That goes to folks who are retired with decades of work experience. That goes to people who aren't pastors and teachers and medical doctors. So we have to be willing, right? And so if that call comes to you, that it's not a closed door, it's an open door. The other side is I think every Christian is called to participate in the Great Commission. And so if you're not going, then you are sending, supporting, visiting caring for, praying for, right? And that, that, the Great Commission is not to a select few. It is, is to all of us. And the other, the other side I would say is, as a missionary, I would appeal to you that just as God was planting seeds to open the door for me to say yes after college, that you would never close that door, that you would be open and willing at any time, if God calls, to go. And the, the second thing I would say is this should all be done in the midst of um, a local church context, right? So I don't know if you all know this, your outreach team and, uh, here at the Grove is doing this really, really well. Okay, we've had a lot of years of experience in support raising and being cared for by churches. Uh, the Grove is exemplary in that. And so if you are feeling the tug of God calling, like, yeah, I, I could do missions, Plug in here. Plug in. Be discipled. Serve. Be equipped. And to be sent out. Cool. Well, Kellen, I appreciate you. We appreciate you and Becca, your faithfulness to, to go and make disciples in Malawi. And the Grove will always be here to support you. So, hope you know that. Thank you. Our uh, prayer at the Grove this year is that we would all gain even more of a heart for making disciples and building his kingdom. Um, our, our church, like I said, we're going to be going through the book of Mark. We'll be doing this with our residency that I talked about uh, last week and having uh, people apply and even sending them to do church planning. But, but we also even want to become more intentional to come alongside those who are even considering to go on the mission field and help prepare the way for them as we train them. Um, we're going to be starting like a pipeline for those who want to go into mission work. Because we have people that we know that come and tell us, hey, I want to I go into mission work. Um, so we're going to do that. We're actually going to offer a meeting on December 5th 
um, at, at 12 o'clock after that Sunday service where our outreach team is just going to even prepare a plan um, for different classes that you can go to. We want you to get to know us. Uh, we, want you to, we want to get to know you as well. I didn't know. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for this again. We'll just see. If no one stands, that's okay again. <laughs> oh, for two. <laughs> um, if, if you have felt a calling of missions in your life, and that's something that you think God is stirring in your heart, would you stand as you're just, not that you're 100% you're going, but just something that you're considering right now. Is there anyone in this service? I know this is our small one. I just, wanna, I just even want to pray over you if there's anyone here. Anyone today? All right, we have someone right here. Awesome. Right on. Is there anyone else? I, I just want to pray. You can have a seat. It's okay. I'll pray over you. What's your name? Vanessa. All right, cool, Vanessa. I'll pray for Vanessa and for those two. We'll have some outreach partners up front here that would love to get your name and tell you about that meeting that we have coming up. And uh, just want to, um, well, I'm going to pray for you right now. Well, Father, we come before you. We pray for Vanessa and we pray for other people in our church over this weekend who feel a calling to go into mission work and pray that our church will be faithful to come alongside of them, equip them, train them, and prepare the way for them to go. Um, so may you just continue to show Vanessa what you want from her and help us to come alongside her as her local church. We pray this in your name. Amen. So December 5th is that meeting for, for everyone else. Like Kellen said, the call to follow Jesus is for all of us. He makes us become fishers of men. He wants to build his kingdom. We're excited to dedicate a whole year to this topic. Um, as, as you walked in today, you were given a Trek booklet this may even be something that you want to do to, to expand your view of, of making disciples and to see what God's doing in another place of the world. The Grove has a lot of short-term treks that you can check out. If that's not the right time for you, it could also be used as like a prayer booklet just to pray for different missionaries. Um, so, so go through that book and see the different people that we're uh, supporting along, along the way. Um, as we close, I, I want you just to be reminded uh, of, of even the sermon title. It, it was called The Time Is Now. Um, Jesus came and it was time for the kingdom of God to be established. Jesus' call for us to follow him is supposed to be immediately and completely. So even as I, as I ask you this, um, what is God calling you to do right now? At this point in your life, where is he leading you? What is he wanting you to do? And I would just ask, let's not hesitate. Let's not put God in the waiting room. But let's do exactly what the Lord has called us to do. Let me pray, and the worship team will come out. We'll sing one more song together. Father, we love you and we praise you. And I pray, Lord, that throughout this year, as we focus our attention in the book of Mark, we focus our eyes on you, that you would lead each person in this room to exactly where you want them to go. Um, Lord, that we would be faithful to do all that you want, and that we would follow you immediately and completely with every aspect of our life. Um, so, Lord, lead us. We pray over the offering that people give today that you would bless it and use it to bring more into your kingdom. And we pray that this last song that we sing, Lord, that our heart would just sing your praises of how good you are. We pray this all in your name. Amen.
great to worship alongside all of you this evening. If you need prayer for anything, you'd like some prayer, we'll have prayer partners down here. They would love to spend a little bit of time with you. Also right over where it says Guest Central, if you're brand new with us, you can go over and uh, we'd love to be able just to, to greet you, say hi. Also our, you know, we have Joe Hobbs is up here. Uh, if you, you know, Daniel had you, you know, ask people to stand. If you didn't stand but would like to talk more about that, you can come right down and talk with us here as well. God bless you. Have a great rest of your evening. 